Thank you, Cinzia, for the introduction. So uh, these are my financial disclosures. The first one is relevant for this talk. So um, we are very happy and proud to have in the audience two of the pioneers of cross-linking, that is Dr. Afezi and Dr. Paolo Vinciguerra. So they know that when we started the journey of cross-linking, we started evaluating stress strain because we were stiffening the cornea. So this is what we were evaluating for the outcome. So, but in clinical practice, we cannot do that, at least not until now. So we evaluate the marcation line, uh, we have used ocular response analyzer, but most of the time, what we do is we wait and see. So what is the normal post-op of, of a patient? So when you have a, a patient after cross-linking, most of the patient after one month, they come to you and pachymetry is worse, visual equity is worse, curvature is worse, and aberrations are worse. So you have your resident that will come to you and say, so? Is it worse? And, but also the patient will tell you, doctor, did we have any effect? So either you lie to the patient and you say, yes, sure, or you say, we have to wait. That is the truth. Because we know uh, for, for long-term studies that visual equity gets better, aberrations get better, and also the cornea gets flatter. But we don't know in the first months. So we have used the demarcation line. The demarcation line is a whitish line that we see in the back part of the cornea with anterior segment OCT. And it has been postulated because they have done studies with confocal microscopy in which they have seen that the, uh, the end of the apoptosis of the keratocytes was more or less where the demarcation line was. So then we say, well, maybe it's an effect and is the way we can measure how the cross-linking works. But there is a very interesting study that was recently published in Graves that has showed that the depth of the demarcation line is not correlated with any of the outcome parameters for cross-linking. This doesn't mean that it has no value, but possibly is not directly correlated with the effect of cross-linking. So we could use it for maybe the depth, but not the direct effect. So why don't we go to basics? Why don't we try to evaluate biomechanics? Because cross-linking induces stiffening of the cornea, and this is what we should measure. So why ocular response analyzer is not the answer? So there are many studies about cross-linking. One was done by Paolo as well. Some studies show it changes, some other not. Which are the reasons? Well, probably because the changes in viscosity mask the changes in elasticity, and so corneal hysteresis might not be the best one to measure them. Also, as if you have used the ocular response analyzer, you know that the more the keratoconus is advanced, the more the peaks are smaller, which means that it's difficult to see a change if the peaks are already small at the beginning. Or because maybe the changes that are induced by cross-linking are different than what we can measure with corneal resistance factor and corneal hysteresis. So then we have the oculus, Corvus ST, that has a big difference compared to the ocular response analyzer. It is still an air puff tonometer, but you are able to evaluate the shape of the cornea that is changing during the deformation. So I'm going to present uh, two studies. The first one is uh, published open access in Journal of Refractive Surgery. So, and there will be a QR code at the end. You can just download it for free or go to Journal of Refractive Surgery. So you don't need to make the pictures. Um, and then the second one is under review, and this is the first time that we show it. So in the first study, we evaluated the effect of cross-linking pre and post with Corvis. So we have included 34 eyes of 34 patients in Liverpool, where I work since a couple of years. Um, these were all progressive keratoconus with a change of K-max and a thinning uh, in the um, area of the cone. It was the standard AP off protocol with uh, 6 milliwatts. And we have done Corvis and Pentacam pre and post. So these are the parameters that we evaluated that I will explain you in a second. This is just the summary, but then we will go a little bit more in details in each of them. So when you have the deformation of the cornea, imagine that first you have the cornea that is convex as normal. Then you have an air puff that is changing the shape of the cornea. So it will begin to deform and it will aplanate. So the first aplanation is where you had the first peak of the ocular response analyzer. Then it gets concave and then it goes back. So these, remember, are the three phases. Convex, aplanation, concave again, 
second applanation back to normal. From this uh, measurement, we have many parameters. So let's start with one of the first, deformation amplitude. Deformation amplitude is the movement of the cornea from the anterior to posterior direction. But the air path is quite strong and is also slightly moving the, in the whole eye. So if you remove the whole eye movement, so you see deformation amplitude and whole eye movement, then you get the deflection amplitude that is just the movement of the cornea. Then we have, so I've explained you what is deformation amplitude, so now I can explain you what is deformation amplitude ratio. That is a new parameter in which you evaluate what is the ratio between the deformation in the center of the cornea and the deformation in the periphery. So a cornea that is like keratoconus will be softer in the center compared to the periphery. So the ratio is increasing. So as simple as that. You evaluate the deformation in the center over the deformation at one or two millimeters and you make a ratio. And then we have the inverse concave radius. This is a very important parameter and is very robust. I will explain you uh, step by step. So you can imagine that a cornea that is soft is going to deform more. If it deforms more, it means that the curve is smaller. If you indent more, the radius is not bigger, it gets smaller. But if you tell to an ophthalmologist, um, so the cornea is soft, then the radius is smaller. They will get mixed up. So we just say we'll do one over the radius, so softer the cornea, higher the inverse radius, just because of that. And if you do the integral of this curve, then you get the integrated radius that is an even more robust parameter that is evaluating pretty much the same thing. Stiffness parameter, well, Cinzia invented it, I will just try to explain it to you. So is a measurement of out of the plane stiffness and is the resultant pressure, so is the pressure coming from the outside, so from the piston, the air puff, minus the pressure that you measure in that moment divided by the displacement. So you're measuring this. So it's an out of the plane stiffness. This is another parameter that we evaluated. So now we go to the results finally. So we have seen that there was a significant rise in corneal stiffness as measured by increase of stiffness parameter, decrease of inverse radius, decrease of deflection amplitude, and the formation amplitude ratio. So these are real numbers. They are highly significant. This is the table. You can download it for free in JRS, so I will just skip it, but I wanted to show you that these are is real science. We are not just showing that we pretend that it works. There is a real difference in, in the patient. And now we'll show you something new. So I've done, after this, I was doing the demarcation line. I was saying, well, why, if the demarcation line works or is doing what we thought it would be, then it should be correlated with the stiffening effect. So why don't we evaluate if there is a correlation? So I say, let's investigate if there is a correlation between the change in stiffness and the, the demarcation line. Same thing, 55 eyes of 44 patients, epi of protocol, progressive keratoconus, corvus and pentacam pre and post, and the demarcation line at one month. So I've done a slightly more complex statistical evaluation because I wanted to put more things inside. Um, so it's a multivariate gen general linear model in which the main two things that I wanted to see is if the delta in, so the change in inverse radius, that is a very robust parameter, was correlated with any of the preoperative parameters like K max, age, right or left, sex, and the demarcation line. But, and actually this is not my idea, is the idea of my professor in Liverpool, Professor K. He said, why don't you do, instead of the demarcation line, you do the demarcation line ratio? Because if you have a demarcation line of 300 microns in a cornea of 600, it's 50% of the cornea. If you have a 300 microns in a 400 cornea, it's much more. And you want to evaluate how much you are cross-linking on the cornea. Let's go to the results. So there was no significant association between the change in inverse radius and demarcation line ratio, age, sex, preoperative K-max, and laterality. There was also another secondary but very interesting finding that there was a significant association between the change in inverse radius and the change in thickness, which makes sense because the thickness is part of the stiffness. Stiffness is, is, is made by material stiffness and geometrical stiffness. So if you have something that is very thick, it will behave like stiff. So if you change the thickness, you're also changing the overall stiffness. Then you have the material that is like wood, rubber, or steel. 
but then also how thick it is. So you, of course it changed. But also, and this was also very interesting, the change in uh, inverse radius was correlated with the preoperative one, one over, sorry, the inverse radius preoperative, which means if you have a stiff cornea, is less likely to get stiffer compared to a soft cornea, which makes totally sense, obviously, but that has never been described before. So, as a first take-home message, the ideal way of judging the outcome of cross-linking will be to directly assess the stiffening effect, and we are able to do that. The demarcation line is indirect. We are not saying that it doesn't work, and we are not saying that we should not measure it anymore, but probably is not a measure of the stiffening effect. It might be a measure of the type of cross-linking we do, because, for example, iontophoresis cross-linking does not induce the demarcation line, or the depth. We don't know. So we, with this study, we confirmed that these parameters are useful, and they're able to detect early changes in biomechanics. Um, we suggest that this should be used in clinical practice, and there was no significant association between the depth of the demarcation line and the change in stiffness, but there was a significant association between the increased stiffening and the preoperative stiffness. So as promised, this is the QR code of the first article. The second one I can't because it's still under review. So um, if you have a QR reader, you go directly. Otherwise, if you don't have it, you go to JRS. You either type Vinci Guerra, Ambrosio, Roberts, and you can download it for free. Thank you.